Hey guys, my name is Graham Johnson. Welcome back to Tabletop Glory. And today we're going to be revisiting some older videos. Videos that were made back when I was still doing everything on my cell phone. And it's about time that we revisited those anyway, as I've had a lot of comments both here on YouTube as well as over on TikTok asking me about some of the basics. Mostly, what are different brush types, brush strokes, what should I be looking at when I'm buying brushes, how do I maintain my brushes, how do we take all of those brush strokes and apply them to our miniatures, and things like that. So we're gonna be taking a look at some things that are not painted yet. We're gonna be talking about some basics about how we can build up our colors and weathering and things like that. We're gonna be talking about cutting out models, what kind of tools we need, etc., etc. Just a real well-rounded type of way of looking at miniature painting for those of you who may just be getting into it. Hopefully those of you who have already been doing this for a while will also take away something new from this. And let's get on with today's video. Now real quick before we jump into today's video, I want to talk about what works for everyone may not work for you and what works for you may not work for everyone. And the same thing goes for what I'm going to be sharing today. Now I'm going to share as much information as I can, whether it's a technique that I use or a technique that I've seen other people use, because I want you guys to have the most material possible to take that come up with your own style and do what works for you. So take everything we're going to talk about today with a grain of salt. Now before we get too far into things, there are three basic tools you're going to need for removing your model from the sprue. Number one, a basic X-Acto knife. Number two, you're going to need some kind of clippers. And number three, you're going to need some hobby glue. Now tool number four is optional. This is a chisel head X-Acto knife. It's really nice for being able to cut parts off nice and flush and get right up next to the model, especially if you're trying to remove a sprue gate from a flat piece of the model. It's really, really wonderful. When it comes to the different types of instructions that you may get in your various model kits, the New Games Workshop instructions tend to be some of the most forgiving, but can also be some of the most confusing for new model makers. Just keep in mind that everything should have either some kind of arrow or dotted line leading you from where it is labeled to where it needs to end up on the model, regardless of what brand of model kit you may have purchased. Now in the case of Games Workshop, oftentimes we have different ways that the model can be assembled. And in these newer instructions, they're very clearly labeled with different colors. But just keep in mind that sometimes models can be assembled in different ways depending on what parts you add to them, and those choices are all yours. Now in the case of this kit here, we can see that the head is labeled C4, and we can see that the arm is C5, and this little gun belt thing is C11. And that's to indicate where on the sprue that we can find those parts to remove them to then add them to the model. So here I'm going to show you an up close look on what I meant by where it shows us it can be found on our sprue. Now in the case here of this one here, where my thumb is pointing, we can see that our first piece is labeled C108. So we're going to go over to our sprue and we're going to search it up and we can see that each of these parts is labeled. We have sprue C is available here and then over on the right hand side we're going to see that we have part 108. And then all we're going to do is we're going to take our hobby clippers. Now if you don't have a pair just be very careful with a razor blade. But we're going to go ahead and figure out where our sprue gate connects to our model so that we don't accidentally remove something that needs to be on the model. And then we're going to clip a little bit away from where our part actually connects. This is to make sure that cleaning things up will be a little easier and that we don't accidentally damage the model during the cleanup process. So we're just going to go around the part and go ahead and remove all these sprue gates to remove our part from the sprue itself. Once the part has been removed, we need to go back in and remove those little bits of sprue gate that we left on. Now you could cut it off close with a hobby nipper, or you could cut it off even close with a razor blade, but this is where my favorite tool, the chisel tool, comes into play. Just know that if you're going to use a razor blade, you should try to use it in a bit of a sawing motion. Be nice and slow, and if you apply pressure, be very gentle with the pressure that you apply. You don't want to push it into your hand on accident. Try to keep your fingers clear at all times and always cut away from yourself. When using the chisel head, remove small amounts at a time. You'll see that once it breaks free, quite a lot of energy is expended and it can be really easy to cut yourself, so be very careful when using chisel head razor blades. But you can see that it made quick work of this and it kept things nice and flush. 
Now, if you happen to have shaky hands and you don't trust yourself to get right up close to the edge of the model, you can go ahead and take the back side of your razor blade, put your thumb along the face of the blade, not the sharp side, but the actual side of it, the face of the blade, and you're going to push against what little is left. And you're just gonna kind of scrape away at it until everything's flat. Now this method can cause some gaps, but as long as you remove a small amount at a time, you should be fine. Now once you have multiple pieces cut out, it's time to start gluing things together. It's time to actually do the assembly part of this whole process. Now you can do a method called dry fitting to make sure that you understand where the pieces are going to go. That's where you hold the pieces together without any glue in the model, just to make sure that everything lines up properly and that you don't need to do any additional cleaning. This is going to help you to stop from making a mess with your hobby glue, especially considering that plastic glue melts the two pieces of plastic together. It's important it's important to make sure that we know exactly where the piece is going to go before we start applying glue. Otherwise we could make a mess, we could ruin the model, or we might end up gluing a part in in the wrong place and the rest of the model won't go together properly. Now it's important to use as little glue as possible because we don't want to make a huge mess. We just want enough to coat the surface. So go ahead and either use an old brush to go along with your hobby glue or if your hobby glue has a brush applicator, try to put on as thin a coat as possible. Some people like to put glue on both pieces. Personally, I don't see the difference. So go ahead and line it back up exactly how we did with the dry fit now that we know exactly where it needs to end up. You'll see that I'm applying what appears to be quite a lot of pressure, but I promise you it's very little and it's already stuck in place. It was only just a few seconds. You saw that all in real time, the footage isn't sped up. Hobby glue is very quick and efficient at what it does, as long as you're not using too much of it. But what would happen if we couldn't actually get the parts back apart, or perhaps it was a bit fiddly and we needed to hold everything together? You can use a product such as Thin Cement. Now this is a product by Tamiya, but there are other companies that make similar stuff. And you can basically just brush it right along the crack and the capillary effect soaks down into the model and it does a really great job at binding everything together for pieces where you just can't let go again once you get them into place. The only thing to keep in mind with this is that it won't get into the core of the model, meaning it has no penetrating power. It's just going to bind near the surface, which is why it's important that if you can take it back apart and use a thicker glue, in my personal opinion, you should. Now you could also mix a little bit of your sprue, meaning some of your plastic, in with your hobby glue and making more of a paste for these bigger open areas just to ensure that you have good bondage and that you don't have any gaps. However, the problem with this is, is it creates a lot of cleanup. Now there are other videos where I've talked about that and there are videos where I've talked about how to clean up gaps and holes using things like green stuff. And I'm gonna go ahead and link that video here for those of you who are interested in that. So now it's time to talk about how to prep the model for paint. We've got it all together, we do one final look over, make sure we haven't missed anything, and now it's time to start painting. However, there's something that you need to keep in mind, something that you may not be aware of. You see, there is a mold release that usually is still sticking to the plastic. Most companies do a great job at removing it. GW is one of those companies that oftentimes does a really wonderful job at removing it. But every now and again, it does come into play. And unfortunately, mold release is like an oily substance that's used to help remove the plastic from the molds that is also hydrophobic, meaning that your paint will not stick to it. It doesn't matter how many coats of spray paint you try to put on top of it, even if you manage to get a coat that does stick, it'll rub off quite easily with your hands, so you need to wash the model to remove it. Now whether you're sticking your model down to a block of wood with some poster putty or you happen to have a name branded hobby holder, I highly recommend that you use one as often as possible. Your own worst enemy is your fingers, whether it be that you have some glue, some paint, or just the oils on your hand touching the model. You can oftentimes ruin your own work by complete accident. I can't tell you the number of times I've either found a fingerprint in one of my paint jobs or I've found a little bit of paint from something else because something wasn't quite dry or cured yet. I touched it and now I've got some weird color all over another color. Just try to use a painting handle as often as possible to eliminate these problems. If you do not have a spray booth to spray inside, weather permitting, you should always try to spray outside and regardless of where you spray, you should always use an N95 or an R95 mask. 
I use an R95 because it's rated for all the different fumes that come from my spray paints that I use. Regardless of what brand of spray paint it happens to be, I know I'm going to be safe. Now I'm using my painting handle to try to keep the bulk of the paint off of my hand here and I'm spraying from about 6 inches to 1 foot away. That's roughly about the size of your shoulder blades. You should try to always keep your source of your paint that far away. We're also going to be doing what is known as Zenifly priming in this and that is where we take a gray and spray from the horizon line up and what that's going to do is it's going to allow us to have some shadows and some mid-tones and then finally we're going to take bright white from directly above to about a 15 degree angle and this is going to complete our Zenifly prime. Now you could Zenifly prime using an airbrush and that would give you a much greater control over your gradient from your black to your gray to your white. However, in this case, I need this more or less just to see the gradient between where my shadows need to end up and where my highlights need to end up. If you're painting with more translucent colors, such as washes or glazes or even contrast paints, this gradient between your bright whites to your dark shadows is significantly more important and you may want to take more time to kind of block those out and to get your smooth transition correct. However, in my case, I'm not super concerned about it as I tend to paint with less opaque layers. On screen is a pretty great example of what Zenifil priming should look like the first few times you do it. It is a little bit of a speckled appearance and depending upon the spray paint you're using or the airbrush you're using, you can get a much smoother transition between your highest highs and your lowest lows. One of the best ways to do that, in my personal opinion, is to do it while the paint is still wet. When you put on your black paint, immediately switch to your gray and then immediately switch to your white. You will get a much smoother transition and a much smoother fade. Now you can reinforce your shadows from beneath and we're gonna go ahead and show you what that looks like now. Now in my opinion, this tends to make the model look a little bit muddy and I don't particularly like it, but I do know a lot of people who spray their grays and their whites and then they reinforce the blacks from underneath. Now that we got our model all assembled, let's take a second to talk about paintbrushes, the different types of paintbrushes, and then let's get started and I'll show you how to use them and different techniques that can be used to make your model look awesome. Paint brushes. A lot of times when we're first getting into miniature painting, we don't really know what we're looking at. We just kind of buy a generic -y brand from either something like Walmart or wherever, and it usually doesn't help us at all, and we don't realize that until it's too late. So let's talk about the brushes I use and why. Most paintbrush brands have a number associated with them. In this case, this size 6 is a large brush, and in the case of a small detail brush, we might see a number such as 10 zero. Now typically the smaller the number, the smaller the brush is going to be. And in this case, on the left hand side here, we have a 10 followed by slash zero. Any number that is in front of a slash zero indicates how many sizes smaller than a size zero brush it is. That can be really confusing when you're first getting into miniature painting, but just keep in mind that as long as it has a slash zero, that any number in front of it indicates how many times smaller that brush is from a size zero brush. Now what about brushes that don't have a conventional tip to them? What about these flathead brushes or shovel head brushes as I've sometimes heard them referred to as? Now these can be really great for things like base coating or they can be really awesome for things like dry brushing. And a lot of people even like to use large makeup brushes for dry brushing because they can be quite soft and they're not going to damage the model. Now personally, I like these really large flathead brushes because they tend to have really soft bristles, just like a makeup brush, but that's my personal opinion, and you may want to decide to invest in a cheap makeup brush just to try it for yourself. Now we also have these interesting brushes as well. Unless you're doing something extremely fancy, you really don't have a reason to have these types of brushes in your arsenal unless they happen to come as part of a kit. Now with the very long bristle brush, that tends to be the type of thing that people use for pinstriping, and it can be really nice for working on detail work, especially across a large army if you're doing assembly line painting, as it holds quite a lot of paint. Now with a scroll tip brush, as you can see as I kind of attempt to show how you would use it, it's designed to kind of swivel back and forth so that while you do freehand work, the brush is doing the bulk of the work and you're getting these nice smooth curves. I personally don't really like using them for this sort of work for miniatures because of how small a scale we use them. However, because of this bent nose on the brush, it's really great for getting in behind parts of models to paint in behind things that you normally wouldn't be able to paint. 
like the backside of a cape if you've already glued your model down. If you've ever looked at GW brushes, you'll notice that a lot of times their small detail brushes are kind of shaped like this, and they're really great for covering somewhat large areas on a model, like painting an entire cape. It holds a decent amount of paint, and it does a really great job at distributing it across the surface of the model. However, my personal opinion is I don't really like them. I like the tip on a brush to actually be sharp, so that I can use it not only for base coating, but also for detailing and edge highlighting but we'll talk a little bit more about that real soon. Every now and again I get asked what types of brands I use. I like Master Stroke and Fine Touch just because they're regularly available to me. However, if that's not what's available in your area, let's talk about what you should be looking at. You want a brush with a really nice tip and a large body. Typically, if you go and you see that the brushes are labeled for both acrylic and watercolor, you're gonna be good to go. And the reason for this is we want something with a nice sharp tip for dealing with detail work, but something that has a large body for holding a lot of paint. This is because miniature paints tend to dry out really, really quickly, especially when they've been thinned out with some kind of an acrylic thinner. Now before we talk about cleaning our brushes, we have to get them dirty. So let's take a second to talk about palettes. Palettes are really awesome. There's hard palettes, and then there's also wet palettes. And they're really amazing. They kind of do different jobs depending upon what you're wanting to do with them and what you're wanting to do with your miniature painting. And there's no shame in starting with one or the other and then moving into the other or preferring one over the other. But let's take a second to talk about some of the advantages and the disadvantages and why you don't want to just paint directly out of the pot. So as you can see here, a well-loved and well-used dry palette. This is a traditional hard palette and uh, they're very important regardless of their size for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you're working on terrain, it's a great way to kind of work with large batches of paint. But number two, my favorite way is keeping our metallic separated from our wet palette. Now, it's okay if you don't end up using a wet palette or you use one and you decide you don't like it, that's fine. And you also don't have to have a wet palette when you're first starting to do miniature painting as it can be kind of an investment. Now, it's important to keep our metallics out of our wet palette for one reason in particular, as a lot of the best metallics you're going to ever get to use are either pre-thinned for an airbrush or are alcohol-based paints. And those paints are going to easily soak through the paper that is in our wet palette and destroy our wet palette. It's going to soak into the sponge and kind of mess with the sponge, and especially if it's alcohol-based, it's going to dry out the sponge, and until all that alcohol gets out of there, it's going to constantly dry out the sponge and mess with the rest of the paints in the palette. Now this is my Masterson's wet palette. This is one of my favorite wet palettes that I've gotten to use, and it is the only one that I personally own. Now, that having been said, a little bit of water does evaporate at a time. However, I have managed to keep the paint moist for well over two weeks. Now that is while constantly using it and constantly topping it off with a pipette. However, one of the best ways to just top the sponge off is to go ahead and take a pair of tweezers, fold back your little layer of paper there, and then go ahead and add a splash of fresh water. Now I try to make sure that the water I use at the very least is clean water or filtered water as I don't want any sediments kind of getting into my paint, and that's the best way to assure that. Now, if you put a little bit of too much water into your wet palette, it's not a big deal. You can kind of just dump it back out. Now, if you have a big glob of paint there, you are going to blend it in with your water, so just be conscious of that. You want just enough that you can get a little bit of water to run into the corners, and that should let you know that it's sufficiently wet. Now one of the big mistakes I see a lot of new miniature painters doing is they're painting directly out of their pot. And as you can see, trying to control your paints directly out of the pot can be a bit of a disaster. It's always going to be kind of thick paint. You're not going to be able to draw a perfectly straight line. No matter how much you try, you might get a little too much in one place or another. And you're not going to get a very consistent flow or a smooth finish. So how do we kind of work around this and avoid this? Well. One of the best ways is to go ahead and scoop some out and put it on a palette. Whether it's a wet palette or a dry palette, it doesn't really matter. And there's a lot of wonderful products that we can use like airbrush thinner, retarder, glaze medium, that sort of thing. But if you've got none of that, just use a brush full of water. You don't need a lot of water, just a singular brush full. And that should be more than enough to sufficiently wet your paint down. 
Now you do need to be careful about any water droplets kind of sticking to your furl as that's going to flood out your palette and put way too much water into what you're trying to mix up. But you're just going to go ahead and start off the edge of the paint and kind of blend it in in a circular fashion like that. And you're looking for the consistency of being able to draw a smooth consistent line. So as you can see here I do a little bit of a squiggle and that's my little test to make sure that my consistency here is good. Now after a while you will be able to teach yourself to do this on your own just based on visual. You won't need to do the little squiggle test and you'll find that most paint brands will require the same amount of water to thin down for the same amount of paint regardless of its color. Now that we've gone from prepping our tools all the way through to prepping our palette, we're ready to start putting paint on a miniature. Now I know this feels like it took a long time and it kind of did, but I promise that these are things that become subconscious and we stop thinking about them farther down the road. The more you paint, the more this is going to be easier and easier for you every single time. Now we're going to be talking about a lot of the verbiage and the jargon that gets used by miniature painters and this is an excellent opportunity to learn a lot of the terms that we tend to use. The reason for this is, is it's not only going to be more apparent for more videos from me going forward but from many other miniature artists here on YouTube. This is a great opportunity to learn a lot of the words that we use and a lot of the phrases we use and to start using them yourself when describing your own paint jobs to other people. It's a great way to make sure that we're all on the same page. So one of the first techniques we're going to be covering here is called layering. Now layering is important because it allows us to build up layers of color. Now layering can also be dependent upon the color underneath it. For example, if you were to paint a blue cape and then you were to layer yellow on top of it, you could get a green fade in there as long as you don't layer up too many colors of yellow. Now in my case here, we're going to be using this bluish green color as our base tone. We're going to be mixing in a little bit of our high tone. So my trifecta of color that I tend to refer as, we have our base, our mid, and our high tone. We're mixing a little bit of that together to get our mid tone here. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a layer across everything that sunlight would cover, as well as a little bit more than what the sunlight would cover. What this is going to do is it's going to give us more of a natural fade and give the fabric a bit of a translucent color to it. Meaning it's going to feel as though sunlight could pass through it. Now if you were to apply layers to something say a little less organic, say a toolbox or something of that nature, you would want to focus strictly where the light is covering with nice hard sharp edges between your shadows and your highlights. Now I'm adding another layer of highlights here and I could blend up as many colors as I wanted so long as I leave a little bit of the previous layer on beforehand. Now I purposely went ahead and made this layer a little bit brighter than it needed to be and my mid-tone a little bit darker than it needed to be. We're going to be showing off a few more techniques here in a moment that can help blend your layers together when colors aren't quite where you want them to be. Now I want to take a second to talk about a technique called feathering and this is a good way to blend your edges in, especially on something more organic. Essentially we're kind of making this back and forth erratic motion with not necessarily a defined edge, meaning that some of my highlights are going a little bit farther than others. And then we're kind of re-blending that back in with the edge highlight. Now the reason for this is, is it kind of feathers out the edge of our edge highlight. It blends everything together. Now this can be accomplished using dry brushing as long as you're using very thin layers of paint with multiple passes and building it up over time. But I thought I would go ahead and show this technique off as it does have its purposes and it does have good places where it's needed. Oftentimes things can feel a bit flat, especially when working with things like fabric or organics. One of the best ways that we can add texture without taking away from something or without having to add something is through stippling. So I'm going to be stippling on the inside of the cloak just to kind of show you guys what that can look like on a cloak. Uh, you could use this on any side of the cloak, on any lighting condition, and just know that it's going to work. It's going to add a ton of beautiful texture, but is going to be very subtle. Now, similar to dry brushing, we want to wipe off the majority and just come in with the bare minimum of the paint on the brush. Now, you can go full hog, in my opinion. It just depends on how much surface area you're trying to paint. But if you want it to be subtle, you want to treat it like a dry brush and do multiple passes with a thin coat of paint on your brush. Now I want to take a second to talk about washes and you can make washes mostly that is one part paint to 10 parts water but we're going to be using a Beltan green wash today from Games Workshop and we're just going to go ahead and apply this across the entire cloak. Now this is going to do one of two things. It's going to tint 
the surface and in places where we allow it to pool, it's going to darken. So we can use this to darken up recesses as well as blending all our previous colors together. If you'll remember correctly, I said I made my highlight tone just a little bit too bright. I did that on purpose so that when we went ahead and put our wash on top of everything, you could see the difference that a simple wash can make. It really does help to blend all those colors together. Now a technique we're going to cover again is known as edge highlighting that typically gets saved for last but I wanted to go ahead and put this clip in here of me doing this just to kind of show you that it can be done both in like a cross hatch motion as well as just going straight along the edge and it really helps to build up texture. It's another great way besides stippling to again bring texture into the model and put texture where it may not have been sculpted and it really helps to make things look and feel much more dynamic. Now we're going to talk about everybody's favorite technique dry brushing and dry brushing can be done with any amount of paint on the brush just know that the less paint that is on the brush the less that's going to end up on the miniature meaning the less paint on your brush the softer the transition is going to be and the more control you're going to have over how much paint is built up over time. If you have too much paint on your brush during dry brushing, that's actually known as overbrushing. And overbrushing is actually done in a slightly different technique. But we'll cover that here in just a second. So our first step to dry brushing is going ahead and wiping off the majority of the paint from our brush, which seems very counterintuitive. But as you'll see here, I'm getting to the point where I'm no longer depositing the paint down in the recesses. And that's what we want to do. We want to get to this stage in the paint removal process. And then we're going against the grain of the miniature. In this case, we're trying to catch the highest most points of the cape. And we're going back and forth in this motion, depositing this color. Now it's okay if we don't end up getting a nice solid color or a nice solid layer of this color, as we can fix that with the technique we're going to be talking about next. But just go ahead and work that all over your model in a nice back and forth motion and that's going to build up what we call dry brushing. Just be aware that anytime there are imperfections on your model, like in the case of this one here, where my model was 3D printed, there are still some sprue marks left over, dry brushing is going to pick those out. Now you could go back in with glazes or even just your original base tone and knock that out so you wouldn't be able to see it, but if you spent a little bit more time in the prep work, it wouldn't be a problem. It's the same thing with mold line removal. Like we had talked about earlier, you can take the back side of your knife and scrape things down flat and then repaint it if you needed to. Now overbrushing, like I said before, is when we leave just a little too much paint on our brush. Now let's see what happens when I apply this to the miniature. As you can see, I put quite a lot of paint on the mini and in some places I'm actually getting paint maybe necessarily where I don't want it. Now this can be done on purpose if you're wanting to get a deep dry brush, is what I've heard some people refer to it as. You do overbrushing and you go with the grain, in this case with the direction of the fabric. You'll notice that when I do that I'm not only getting a much more solid color, but I'm depositing paint much deeper into the ripple. And that's okay, for certain effects we definitely want that. And for others we want to just keep it on the surface. It's entirely dependent on whether we're painting organic or non-organic. Now let's take a second to talk about glazing because it's different from washes and it is a thinned down paint. However, there is significantly more pigment in a glaze than there is in a wash. And the main reason for that is we're trying to tint the surface of the model as opposed to washing the surface and tinting the recesses. So as you can see on my wet palette there, I'm actually getting the paint quite thin and when I do my little test you'll see that you can actually see the color of the paper underneath the color of the paint and it almost makes it look yellow. We can then use things like glazes to reinforce dry brushing by glazing the color into the highest most recess and what that will do is it'll allow us to have a much smoother much nicer finish. We won't necessarily have tons of texture at the high points which may be what you want or may not be what you want depending upon on how high fantasy or high realistic you're wanting your model to look when it's done. Another really great use for glazing is if you're trying to do an effect like lighting. You can actually glaze in certain colors to give the illusion of lighting on your model. 
A really excellent example of this would be if your character is holding a lamp, you could glaze some yellow or whatever color the lamp happens to be onto the face of your miniature or down the arm of the miniature to illuminate it and to make it look as though the lamp is actually giving off some kind of real light source. One of the last techniques I want to talk about before we move on to combining some of these techniques together is panel lining. Now there are products like Panel Line from Tamiya which do this job pretty okay. Now you do lose a little bit of control because of the way that the product is made and how it kind of seeps into everything. So if you need to have more control, you're gonna need to make it yourself. Now in theory, a panel line can be whatever color you want it. However, in my personal opinion, black works the best. Now, we're kind of shooting for the consistency of a wash meets a glaze. This is going to allow it to flow off your brush better. If you can buy something like Flow Improver, I highly recommend it, as it's going to make your life a lot easier for doing this step. Now, panel lining isn't required on all miniatures, and really, in my personal opinion, only works the best when you're doing things like non-organic subjects, such as armor or machinery or things like that. Uh, but as you can see here, quite easily compared to the left, the right, as well as the up and the down, meaning the shin versus the calf, there is a huge difference that little thin line makes on this model and really adds a lot of shadow and depth and really helps to make it feel more alive. Now again, you'll notice I didn't do this originally on this model and that's because it's a technique that although is good to have, I don't personally like. Now I'm gonna go ahead and play this clip at high speed because it is just me combining a few of the techniques that I showed already. We're gonna be starting out with dry brushing. We're gonna start out with our dark green and then move to a brighter green. You can see here that I'm using a combination of dry brushing and over brushing to give the effect that I want. By working with these nice thin layers, I'm able to control the color a lot better and build things up while still leaving the recesses nice and dark. I can then go in and define all of these little roof panels using my brightest highlight color. Now, I could choose to go back in and re-blend all these edges in with a bit more dry brushing. However, I think it looks just fine in the end. Now, the reason I'm choosing to do this on a piece of terrain is I want to show just how quick and how fast you can get this done. And although I am playing this video back in high speed, I assure you it only took me about 10 minutes to do this entire roof, and I think you'll agree, it looks pretty great when it's done. Now you can go back in and use things like glazes and washes and other techniques like that as well as dry brushing to do a mixture of weathering and other things like that and bring a lot of other colors into this roof as well and take it into a spectrum that could be considered quite realistic looking considering it's just a piece of wargaming terrain. In any case, all these techniques can be combined to create some really awesome pieces, as well as things like your regular miniatures. All the techniques we talked about in today's video went into making that penance engine. Cool, we did it. And you did it too. We painted the thing. Now it's time to pack it all away and enjoy the fruits of our labor, right? Well, we need to clean our brushes. Despite how clean we may have thought we got them during the washout stages in between all the different colors, there's still some paint trapped in the brushes. Now depending upon whether you're like me and you're a little bit lazy or you're more like me in the sense that I think it's good enough and if a brush gets really bad I'll handle it then, we really ought to be cleaning our brushes every single time we paint. Now I do paint every single day and so for me it's not that big a deal for me to forget from time to time, but I'm going to show you how you should be cleaning your brushes. Now there are different techniques for cleaning your brushes. I'm going to show you the technique that was taught to me when I took a painting class in college. It works really great for me and I hope it works really great for you. Now I wanted to start this segment off by showing out my washout pot. Now one of the things about my washout pot is it's corrugated in the bottom and a lot of times you can hear me racking my brush in it whether it be in a recording or in a live stream. Just understand that I recognize that I am beating the living kingdom come out of my brushes when I do that and that I don't use nice sable hair brushes when I'm doing that. I, I'm very aware that I am going to destroy really nice brushes by doing so. One of the things also, I like to add a little bit of rubbing alcohol into my water in my washout pot, and I try to use clean, relatively filtered water. This is a great way to help make sure that you're not going to get any kind of nastiness going on with your paint scheme. I've heard horror stories of people having mold grow on their miniatures because they didn't use clean water. So not only does adding a few drops of rubbing alcohol help to clean the brush and break down acrylic paints, but it also kills anything that may be in the water. 
Now if you ever sit down to paint and it seems as though your brush is a bit stiff, don't fear, don't think you've ruined your brush. You can actually take a few drops of rubbing alcohol, either 75% or better, into the palm of your hand and then you're going to let the brush soak in the palm of your hand. You'll notice immediately some of the pigment has already started to come out of my brush and as soon as the bristles were nice and pliable, I'm just going back and forth in that circular motion. That's going to help to make sure the rubbing alcohol gets in and starts to dissolve all of that acrylic paint and it's going to make so that the bristles scrub themselves. Now whether you're cleaning your brush at the end of a painting session or you're restoring a brush, use some clean water and some brush soap and just kind of do that same circular motion in the palm of your hand and allow it to work its way into the bristles. This is going to do a really great job at getting all of the gunk out of your brush as well as trying to keep all that stuff away from the furl of the brush. This is a really great way to get more longevity out of your brush and it's a really great way to save brushes without having to throw them away and get new ones. You're going to need to do this a few times over again with the same brush until you get to the point where you no longer see pigment coming back out of your brush. Now at this point you can do one of two things. You can either wash it out and leave it well enough alone or if you've got a brush that's having a hard time holding its tip you can run the brush through the crease of your hand and leave the soap in it to dry overnight. This is going to help teach the bristles to go back to their original shape. Now some brushes may have a curl in it that's gone too far and you may not be able to save it. And that's okay. Sometimes we can't save our brushes. Just know that if you do this every time you start to see that you're having an issue, you will get more life out of your brush. And in the morning when you're ready to paint again, you just go ahead and wash it out in some clean water and you should be good to go again. And there you go my friends, whether you're planning to paint for D&D, Warhammer, or even just traditional modeling, these are all great techniques and tips that I hope you will take with you and apply to your miniature painting. Now although it's true I didn't cover 100% of everything, these are the basic techniques that I feel that all miniature painters should know and I think you should all start with. Feel free to experiment around and then come back and ask with as many questions as you may have to inspire future videos in this series. I'd love to make some more painting 101 style guide videos and teach more about how I paint miniatures as well as teaching more serious tutorials. I know people have been asking for an object source lighting tutorial and I do promise it is on the way. In any case, thank you guys so much for all the love and support you've not only shown this channel, but shown my other social media. The fact that we are at 750 subscribers is blowing my mind. I never in my wildest dreams believed that this many people would believe in what I'm doing, let alone be interested in what I'm doing. So thank you guys so much, and thank you for inspiring so many amazing tutorials and so many wonderful projects. And until next time, may your display case always be filled and your pile of shame never run empty.